Hi, so I'm Brendan Bennett. I'm a master's student under Rich Sutton at the University of Alberta, and I'm talking today about, yeah, uh, about comparing direct and indirect methods for estimating the variance of the return using temporal difference learning. So we have a, a, just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I have a little bit of background information for those people who might not be familiar with temporal difference learning or reinforcement learning in general. I have a little bit of math that motivates or maybe explains our algorithm, the algorithm itself, and then of course the promised comparisons between our algorithm and uh, one of the alternatives. So in reinforcement learning, we model the world as a agent interacting with an environment. So the agent gets an observation, it selects an action according to a policy, executes that action, and the environment responds by giving it a reward and a new observation. The cycle repeats and then you get a trajectory of the form, uh, you know, state, action, reward, state, action, reward, and so on. Um, now, the distinguishing thing about reinforcement learning is we don't want to learn about just the rewards, we want to learn about the discounted sum of the rewards given that we're in a particular state. And so this is called the return and defined, you know, as just uh, reward starting now plus the discounted next reward plus the, you know, twice discounted reward after that and so on, where we're using a state dependent discount factor uh, that has been recently explored a bunch in the literature. Um, so the nice thing about this uh, the MDP framework and reinforcement learning is that we have a recursive structure for the return so that we can express it in terms of, uh, you know, the reward plus the discounted return starting from the next state. And then that leads naturally to the Bellman equation where we can describe the uh, reward or, sorry, the return as uh, a sort of expected value of reward plus the value function of the next state which leads naturally to an objective or to a way that you can learn the, uh, learn to predict the return online in a fairly efficient manner. Um, so the prototypical example of that is TD Lambda, where we start with, uh, you know, we just have the temporal difference error, that delta T, uh, which is the reward plus the uh, estimated value of the next state discounted appropriately less the current value for the state that we're in. And then we have uh, eligibility trace, which is perhaps maybe not something you need to worry about uh, if you're completely unfamiliar with the theory, but we just update using these deltas where it's the difference between the reward and the expected value of the next state minus the value that we were predicting given that we're in the current state. And all of that is very straightforward. The algorithm is nice. You have uh, you know, guarantees of convergence um, under linear function approximation. It's very computationally efficient and uh, it's an online algorithm, meaning that at each point in time you are using the most current information. You don't have to wait for a batch processing step in order to uh, update your predictions. Um, but despite how useful Knowing the expected value is, it is uh, kind of limiting because there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can learn about the reward sequence and the return. And uh, recently there's been some strides to do just that. The second most important thing to know about, arguably, after the uh, expected value of the return is the return's variance because you could have either very consistent uh, mapping between an action and what uh, the return is gonna be, what you're going to get, or it could be much more scattershot, and if you only have the expected value, you don't know which of the two cases it is. Um, so as far as like practical applications of this, you can incorporate notions of risk, confidence, uncertainty, reliability into the decision making if you're you know, deciding what to do based on the output of your uh, learning algorithm. You can use it inside of the learning algorithm in order to do hyperparameter tuning. So for instance, adjusting step size or the trace parameter or whatever else have you. Um, 
And as algorithm designers or users, it gives us a way of uh, measuring kind of what the agent is thinking, maybe a little bit of insight into the model, and uh, you can use that for maybe adjusting representations or identifying problems that the agent is having. Perhaps it has got a very high estimate for variance that uh, seems unaccountable, and so maybe you could adjust things based on that. Um, as I mentioned, there's been a bit of re recent interest in this topic about learning more than just the expected value of the return. So there's the distributional RL paper from Belmar et al. And uh, that one is you know, very general. It covers not learning just the variance, but you learn the distribution. And from that, you can compute all sorts of statistical quantities uh, insofar as your estimate for the distribution is correct. Uh, there's been some people that have specifically addressed learning the variance of the return, but they use a second moment method. So the learning the variance of the reward to go by Tamar and uh, greedy approach to adapting the trace parameter for temporal difference learning by White and White, also co-authors on this paper. And so they do it by just sort of saying, okay, variance is going to be uh, the second moment minus uh, the expected value squared. They define a new approximation target uh, for uh, learning um, the second moment. And then they just compute the variance uh, by using this new thing that they've learned minus the square of the value function. Um, like, it's very nice in terms of the math, and the Tamar paper is particularly a thing of beauty. But in practice, it's, uh, it has some issues. So here's the algorithm, and you see that we have a, you know, the standard TD algorithm on top, learning the value function, and then we have a means of estimating the second moment where we're using the uh, gamma squared as a discount factor, and our reward is uh, the uh, standard reward squared plus the uh, discount factor times the reward times the value function before that we get from, uh, you know, this new approximation target. And then everything proceeds just kind of as standard TD. Um, then you have a way of estimating the variance as this sort of second moment estimate minus the square of the value function estimate. Um, as you might know, if you've done stuff like just data science, estimating uh, the variance from the second moment kind of has numerical stability issues. Um, and it also might have other issues in the sense that if you have a representation that's suited for learning the value function, that representation might not transfer over to learning the variance. Uh, and because of the way that it's set up, you tend to estimate negative variance in some cases, unless you take steps explicitly to prevent that. So why not use the more numerically stable approximation target based upon the central moment, uh, just variance uh, def as defined in there? It's mathematically equivalent, but it might be nicer. It might lead to a better algorithm. Well, spoiler alert, it kind of does. So uh, we have the, uh, you know, some basic identities that allow you to uh, see where we're kind of going with this. You note that the third one is the one that is worth paying attention to. So we sort of say, okay, well, what is the return minus the value function at the current time? And it turns out you can expand that out into a series of deltas. Then. Uh, what remains is to you know, consider, okay, what's the expected value of this squared? Um, you get a uh, you know, delta t plus the discounted value of the return starting from the next state minus the value starting from the next state, all of this squared. You can separate it out. You get a uh, nice almost Bellman equation-like thing, except for the fact that there's a uh, bunch of these cross terms, but as we explain in our paper, there's reasons for believing that those will cancel out. And uh, if you want, I can talk more perhaps after this talk. I tried to fit it in, but I just, I would not have time. So in this case, we're doing something similar to the second moment approach. We're using delta squared as a reward and a discount factor of gamma squared. And then uh, we have an approximation target for which we can use, or for which we can learn the variance. Um, this sort of assumes that we already have a value function and uh, you know you can get one by just using TD and then you attach a second TD algorithm. 
and uh, then you're able to uh, learn the variants using these chained TD algorithms with all the advantages of TD, and uh, it actually works pretty well. So here is the algorithm itself. Um, again, like a slightly more complex, but general version is available in the paper, but we're doing the same thing as they did in the second moment algorithm. You learn the value function following standard TD, and then you just swap in uh, the delta T squared in place of the reward um, that you would normally use for a TD algorithm. And then you just update everything and it works. So if you wanted a look at how the data kind of flows in such an algorithm, um, you know, you just have the TD agent, it has a learning step, it emits a TD error, square that, feed it into another TD algorithm, and that one is estimating the variance. Um, yeah, as uh, mentioned before, there are alternatives. You, know, you might want to use this if you're only interested in the variance and you're not interested in doing distributional RL. Uh, this is a very simple algorithm, very easy to implement, hard to make mistakes with. So if you're already learning the value function using a TD method, you might as well use this in order to learn the variance as well. Um, we suspected that there would be advantages given that we've noted problems with VTD, um, given that it can sort of give you strange or unwanted estimates, and naturally the second moment is going to be a much huger target, so you can expect the, uh, that the uh, stability will be kind of off, it'll be harder to learn. Um, so here we have like the comparison just in terms of the data flow. They're both TD algorithms. VTD is slightly more complicated, but they're trying to do the same sort of thing. Now we get to the empirical results where we actually test these intuitions and see if uh, we've wasted our time. So in the Tamar paper, they tried to estimate the variance using this long chain uh, where the agent starts at the left-hand side and then with probability 0.7 transitions to the right. So it's just a standard random walk or biased random walk. And then the features are, uh, you know, one bias feature and then linear features um, as a sort of, so state one would be one, state two, two, state three, three, and so on. We rescaled them because we were having problems uh, getting VTD to converge at all using this. Uh, by, you know, just dividing by the total number of states. Um, and then when it came to estimating the variance, they augment the features they use for the value function with a quadratic uh, one where it's just one, you know, the previous one, but instead of it being, uh, you know, one over 30, it's going to be one over 30 squared and so on. So, you know, you just run these algorithms and you see kind of how they behave. So we start off with uh, the value function. Initially it has relatively high error, and then once it begins to learn, then both the direct and the indirect methods start to converge. The interesting thing to note is that the direct method converges a little bit faster, and it certainly converges to a lower asymptotic error. So there's some evidence that you know, this case is uh, one of, the, one of the ones where uh, DVTD is going to outperform VTD. But perhaps it's an artifact of hyperparameters. If we change the settings, maybe we could get something better. That turns out to not necessarily be the case. Um, if you look at the step sizes that we swept over, in, in all cases, DVTD is more robust. It still manages to learn quickly, effectively, uh, to a lower error. And uh, even with the best choice of step size that we could find for VTD, it uh, exhibited worse performance than the direct method. And uh, yeah, so if you look at what they actually converge to in terms of the estimates of the variance for the states, you notice that uh, VTD actually seems to track a worse target, um, whereas the direct method cleaves almost entirely to what the true variance is in this domain. 
However, that's kind of an artificial example. Um, you know, maybe there's different behavior in something more complex, so we tried it out in Mountain Car. Now, uh, Mountain Car is kind of a standard reinforcement learning test bed. You have an agent that is uh, in control of a car. It wants to make it all the way up to the hill, but it is not able to just accelerate and go up to the top, so it has to build up momentum by traveling backwards and then using the uh, additional speed it can build up in order to slowly ramp its way up to the top of the hill. Um, it gets uh, a feature that tells it its position and velocity, and then we discretize that, uh, or I believe actually in this experiment we used uh, normalized radial basis functions, but that doesn't matter too much. So as, I'm, as before, we're focusing on the prediction setting, not the control setting. So we first trained an agent to solve this task, then froze its policy, and then we used that to, uh, that as like our uh, test policy to compare these two algorithms. So this is kind of what the trajectories look like in state space. On the bottom you've got the position and then on the y-axis you've got the velocity. And so the agent moves, uh, is trying to get to the right-hand side, but is only able to do it after having moved, uh, you know, slowly rocked back and forth in order to build up enough speed that it can uh, make it all the way over the hump. And the trajectories that we have here are pretty consistent, except that you'll notice that there's a sort of cusp on uh, at the top part of the graph uh, where sometimes the agent appears to make it just fine, and other times uh, it doesn't quite have enough speed, maybe it thought it did, and it ends up uh, having to do another loop around. And so that's an instance where we'd sort of expect variance to show up because we expected to be able to make it to the end, but we didn't have enough speed, and so uh, what we got was substantially different from what we predicted. You can see this is sort of reflected in the average return where there is that sort of sharp cusp um, around uh, that part of the graph um, and also reflected in the value function that is learned by the agent where there's some sort of blurring because right around there, uh, you know, the agent might make it or it might not, but those states are kind of grouped together in the representation. Um, so this is what it looks like when you're plotting the variance. And you can sort of see that, yep, they, uh, you know, there's a lot of variance right around that edge because of uh, the fact that it can sort of fall off. And then all of that is propagated backwards because this is, problem is undiscounted right to the start. Um, and so the uncertainty that you have in terms of how long it's going to take for you to finish the problem is, uh, you know, it makes it, it makes all the stuff that happens earlier in the problem uncertain as well. It's not just a purely local thing. Here we have our DVTD algorithm, the direct one, and we see that it actually seems to grasp this. It learns uh, an estimate of uh, the variance that kind of reflects what our intuitions tell us, what the graphs tell us. And, uh, you know, if you look at the scales on the graph, you know, it's about approximately equal. Um, you know, there's uh, no, uh, like it's not perfect, but this is uh, function approximation, and we're comparing a, you know, good discretization versus just what the agent was able to learn. Now, in contrast, we have VTD, and VTD does not perform very well. It has uh, a huge range in terms of the values that it comes up with, and uh, estimates negative variance in, with a certain amount of regularity, which is not exactly mathematically reasonable. So uh, in, in this particular setting, at least, maybe you could recover it by using a better representation, or maybe you could uh, have the problem fixed if you're using neural nets or something like that. But at least in this particular case, where we're using linear function approximation on a simple test bed problem, we find that DVTD is just a better choice. So, um, I guess if I were to summarize the conclusions of the paper, 
we have that the direct method learns just as fast as VTD and usually faster. It's more robust to changes in hyperparameters and it exhibits substantially better performance, especially under linear function approximation than VTD. Uh, we have more results. Again, see the paper, come by our poster. Uh, my colleague and I will be happy to answer questions. But, um, you know, like, these conclusions are backed up by just about every experiment that we've done. And then to summarize overall, uh, you know, the value function is important, but it's not all important. There's other things that you might want to estimate as well. Uh, the delta squared return is a useful approximation target, and by using that, we are able to estimate the variance. DVTD in particular is a simple algorithm, easy to implement, but it's surprisingly ef effective, and if you, you know, follow the stuff that we discuss in the paper, you'll find that it is flexible and can be used in a number of different applications as well. All right. That's the end of my bit. Uh, does anyone have uh, questions? <laughs>